Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks, Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, High Tech Oki, and everybody, welcome our brand new patron, Matt. Yay! Yay. Matt, welcome, Matt. Matt. Matt, 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 Matt. On this episode of DTNS, it's foldable season. We'll look over who's entering the phone fold. Plus, OpenAI wants to make you healthier. And Etsy has more categories now. But does artist Scott Johnson like those categories? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We promise you will be more informed by the end of this show or your money back. Oh. Especially if you didn't pay anything for it. <laughs> Only no, if I you mean, didn't. you're going to be more informed. <laughs> but you, but we stand by that. You're going to yeah. be more informed. Yeah. Like, you're, you're already more informed because you know about that. Let's start with the quick hits. Amazon has a new version of its alarm clock looking Echo Spot. The bedside table sized Echo has now better visuals and audio and comes in black, white, or blue. It's dropped the integrated camera that was in the previous version. It also splits the circular front into half screen and half speaker instead of all screen as it was in the past. The screen shows animations, not video though. It's $70, though Amazon is running some launch sales, so you might find it at a cheaper price. There is a Ticketmaster data breach that got some customer information, and there's also a separate Ticketmaster hack. Uh, I'm seeing those two get confused with each other. The first is a pretty ordinary data breach, un unfortunately, not great, but but something new. The other is the hack that was actually published in February. There were technical details published about how Ticketmaster generates its electronic tickets. The electronic tickets mostly use rotating barcodes that make it difficult to duplicate. Uh, a lawsuit filed in May has accused a number of people of selling tickets generated by using stolen tokens from the AXS or Access and Ticketmaster websites based on using those technical details that were published in February. Now, it's unclear if they can actually generate the rotating codes or uh, just some barcodes on a PDF, which some events, about 38,000 according to 404 Media, still accept. Uh, so it wouldn't work on most events, but it might work on a few. Anyway, the moral of the story is only buy tickets from trustworthy outlets, and it's probably a good idea to use the ticket issuer system, like Ticketmaster or Access, to transfer them, even if you're buying them somewhere else like StubHub or SeatGeek. Spotify is opening the Pandora's box. Get it? Pandora, Spotify, audio. Wow. Uh, it, Pandora, uh, in this case, is just the box. Uh, Spotify is letting creators invite comments on their podcast listings. Spotify podcasters could already do polls and Q&As, but comments will be private unless a creator approves them to be public or just can be turned off altogether. Comments can be for whole shows, episodes, um, or, you know, a, a version of the two. A, va a phase rollout of the feature started on Tuesday. The Dallas Stars hockey team, or as I call them, the Minnesota North Stars at Dallas, are becoming a fast service that is free ad-supported streaming television, at least in their local market, for their own games. Rather than partner with the regional sports network, as most teams have done for decades, the Stars are launching a service called Victory Plus. Fans inside the local broadcast territory around Dallas can stream the Stars games for free with ads. Uh, if you're a fan of the Dallas Stars and you don't live inside the Dallas area regional territory, you can still watch pregame and postgame and news shows uh, produced by the Stars, but you'll have to go to a subscription service like ESPN Plus to pay for the games. Anybody running the iOS 18 Beta 3 and Apple TV OS 18 Beta 3 can now try Apple Insight in Apple TV Plus shows. This is similar to how Amazon's X-Ray works with information like uh, the actor that you're looking at, the character's name, songs that might be playing in the background. Available when you tap. You can add songs to your Apple Music account if you want as well. Mm, it's kind of nifty. I like X-Ray, so, you know. Could use it on more, I guess. All right, let's talk about this big news about OpenAI and Ariana Huffington's Thrive Global uh, joining up on something called Thrive AI Health. The idea is that Thrive AI Health would train a model on, quote, 
the best peer-reviewed science, uh, alongside, quote, the personal biometric lab and other medical data you've chosen to share with it. So this is a good example of a focused chatbot trained on specific data, reliable data, scientific data, and personal data. That's the kind of thing that can limit the hallucinations and make sure that it's more accurate. Former Google Fitbit exec DeCarlos Love is going to be the CEO of Thrive AI Health. Uh, they have also partnered with Stanford Medicine, the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute at West Virginia, University and the Alice L. Walton School of Medicine uh, for even closer cooperation. The chatbot will not offer diagnoses. This is not going to try to replace your doctor or even your nurse, uh, but it will monitor your health and offer small things that you can do uh, in five areas, life, sleep, nutrition, fitness, stress management, and social connection. So it might do something like say, hey, uh, we see you you're, You tell us you're always drinking a soda in the afternoon. Why not replace that with water with lemon? That will give you less sugar, little things like that. Uh, it is not ready for customers yet. This is not a product that's launching. Uh, they're out there trying to generate buzz, probably get some investor interest and stuff like that. So we don't have details on what I think is probably the biggest question you're going to have, which is, how am I going to keep my health data secure and share it with this at the same time? However, uh, assuming they answer that question, Scott, are there any conditions under which you would use something like this? Um, I mean, I, I, I probably even a little too gung ho when it comes to medical use cases for AI. I actually think this is one area where we're, we're all going to be kind of thrilled with the results over time. Um, so I often forget that, yeah, there's going to be a lot of hurdles when it comes to, you know, how we deal with our, our personal information, how secure is that stuff going to be, um, knowing that giving more of it means a better model, but also giving more of it means giving more of it. Right. So I'm, I'm torn. I'm a little bit torn because I, I think that, uh, all the chatter around AI and all the stuff everybody talks about and the things people get all upheaval about what they forget about is this like rubber meets the road application stuff that I that I like. And some of that is medical. And so I'm kind of all for this. And I'm ready to give them more information than I'm used to giving them. Is it these guys? I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know if I would trust them any more than anyone else or any less than anyone else. AI once or uh, open AI once again, just partnering with everybody and their dog every five minutes, it feels like. Yeah. So well, and don't forget, this is open AI and in partnership with Thrive, creating right. a new company with different people at it, right? So right. yeah, OpenAI has influence over it. We shouldn't forget that, but OpenAI isn't running it. It's not a division of OpenAI. Right, and they're good. They clearly are, <laughs> they have good stuff or else I don't think everybody would be partnering with them. Um, but, but my main takeaway is there will come a day, uh, probably not that far away, where uh, a lot of diagnosis, a lot of treatment plan, a lot of things that deal with exactness, whether it's in surgeries or advanced diagnosis or advanced detection, are going to come from this technology. I really, truly believe that. And the, the more you hear um, your friends who are doctors and lab technicians and these guys talk about it, and they're all talking about it, friends of mine are talking about it that are doctors, they, they also think that the future uh, is this. Should we be cautious as we saunter into this? Absolutely. Should we be concerned about where our data is going and how it's being used? Absolutely. Um, but I think if we hold these guys to the fire and we're looking for, you know, good modern day um, encryption not just techniques. Their feet. And hold their not, entire yeah, person. Their entire to the body to the fire, not the, just the feet. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have to go get your feet checked out. And who knows what AI will hold do. Hold your head to the right? fire. Now you really need business. <laughs> now you're going to do it right. You know, yeah. uh, just uh, as somebody who's I've been in the you know medical system pretty, pretty solidly uh, for some time and because I moved over the last year, you know, I had to establish care with new, you know, primary physicians and, you know, various specialists and that sort of thing. Stuff like this is not going to replace doctors and nurses. It, it, it simply can't. I mean, I can't have like an MRI over a Zoom call kind of thing. Mm. But um, I think that a lot of the kind of minutia of just... I don't know, you know, having a phone call with with, with a, a nurse practitioner or, you know, a variety of things that might have to happen on a somewhat regular basis um, can, can actually be improved using AI. That's where I think this is going. This is not like, 
oh, I have a huge problem. AI, please fix me. Can't mm. be done. Mm. But some of the some of the little things, and for a uh, somebody on you know the patient side of this, sometimes at, at pretty expensive uh, visit where I'm like, all we really did was look over my chart. Why do I have to pay you $370? I know you're talking about where this is going someday, but let, let's let's focus back on what it's, what they're saying it's going to do now. It's not even close to that, right? It's not even the, the talking to the nurse practitioner. This is uh, maybe maybe you should go to bed earlier. <laughs> you know, Maybe you should turn off the TV earlier. But like, my point this is, is that pretty... this is sometimes uh, just conversations that you have with a doctor. Sure. And the yeah. doctor's kind of like, well, Okay, I mean, yeah. and this this, this will be with you more often to remind yeah. you of that. Uh, right. The big question, though, again, uh, is what does it have to do to assure you that it's safe? Because you're to make it work, you're going to have to share your lab core data. You're going to have to sh share your charts from your doctor. If it's on device and it's well audited and open, uh, I'm fine with it. It won't be. Yeah, I don't think OpenAI can do this on device yet. Uh, maybe Meta can, maybe Apple can, but I don't think OpenAI can do it on device, and I don't think they will. So if it's going to go into the cloud, is it going to be open to audits so I can make sure that it's it's safe in the cloud the way Apple Intelligence is doing? I don't expect OpenAI is going to do that. So I'm starting to get less confident that this will be a service I will feel comfortable taking advantage of, at least from the beginning, until a few other people have tried it out and we see what happens. Yeah, I think I feel like whoever's going to lead the charge on this, and if this is the where the charge is being led, fine, but whoever's going to truly lead it, they have to lead with what Tom's asking for. I think you lead with that. You have all the back back end you can handle. That's fine. That's great. All your cool technology. That's neat. But come at me with, here's what we're doing to make sure you're 100 percent protected. Now let's move forward with the application. And then I'm a lot more, you know, willing or eager to to join up. Yeah. Uh, meantime, what's really important is that your phone can fold in half. Whoa. Uh, some of them can. That's for sure. Uh, foldables. They've arrived. They have they have been arrived and will continue to arrive. Samsung is hosting its Galaxy Unpacked announcement tomorrow, Wednesday, July 10th. Honor just scheduled its own foldable event for Friday, July 12th. So it's a foldable week, y'all. But ahead of what's to come, the reviews are now out for the $999 2024 Motorola Razr Plus foldable flip phone. Um, you know, mostly positive reviews. The reviewers generally express fondness for the phone. It's, it has a larger screen, more capable cover screen. Battery life is good, has full IPX8 water resistance at this point. So if you drop it in the toilet, you're probably good to go. The snags is that it only gets four years of software support. The camera quality is just okay. And the inner full size screen, when you, when you do, um, you use it at, at full uh, screen is a 6.9 inch 1080p OLED and apparently isn't that great. It's fine, but not awesome. But if you're into it, the 2024 Motorola Razr Plus is available for pre-order shipping at July 24th. Yeah, and they got that pink one, so it's a nice little nostalgia throwback to the old razors, you know. So, some mixed opinions on the pink. Some people noticed mm. that it got scratched easier. Uh, oh. Well, people, and it was kind of like uh, yeah. the material. Yeah, seemed like yeah, it yeah. wasn't going to hold up uh, too well over time. I gotta say, I mean, some some of the, and again, I don't have a foldable at this point, but some of the the pros of foldable just uh, sizes really makes sense to me. Part of the reason that I think that I'm not a great candidate for this is that I've got a, you know, a, a, a large iPhone, you know, the Pro Max, and I've also, you know, got my Apple Watch. They work in tandem. I feel like my Apple Watch is my cover screen. But if I didn't have the Apple Watch, or for whatever reason, I wanted this all to be on uh, a single device that would be uh, easier to put into a smaller purse or pocket... I think the foldable market is very interesting. Mm. I was uh, upstairs earlier talking to my wife about foldables because we were preparing for the show and I was thinking about them. And I said, what do you think of these? And I showed her the picture and she says, oh, none of my pants have big pockets. Women's pants in general, they don't make big pockets in women's pants. I always ask, why are you always carrying your phone in your back pocket? And she says, because women's pants front pockets you can't do are in the front. terrible. No, she, you can't she, sit yeah. down. I think we, we have no idea. Dudes have these huge pockets in front. We just don't know what people are dealing with. So <laughs> she explained that to me. on the pants you're wearing, of course. Of, yes. of course. But yeah, I, but most I, of hers I, didn't. 
And yeah. so she goes, well, that would fit in there. And I'm like, yeah, what? She goes, ooh, when's this happening? I said, well, it's they're already happening. Happened. They it's already been out for years. Yeah, That's what I told yeah. her. I said, these have been out Don't here for years. Don't call it a comeback for flip phones. <laughs> no. Yep. In fact, no. if anything, they're just going to get smaller. They're going to fold more often. Like we're in the thick of well, it. Well, the Razer and- is getting a bigger screen, mm-hmm. but it's staying the same size. Yeah. So it's it's not even getting smaller, but it's getting better. Is yeah. is the idea? Yeah. Sure. And and that's the flip phone thing. I, I I will I will speak for the for the book fold. You know, how, however you say it. I I I have the Pixel Fold. Um, I don't use it as much as I use my iPhone, but I use them both. And I do like, I especially take it when I travel, because I can be on a plane and just be using the normal size phone most of the time. But then when I want to watch a video or something, just pop it open. And there's, there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of advantages and multiple form, form factors, right? There's, there's not just one foldable form factor. Yeah, for me, so it always came down to, you know, when, you, when I talk to people who own these, they give me their various reasons why they think that foldables uh, are great. And I always kind of run into this wall of everything they've said doesn't really convince me. Like, I don't know why I would go all in. And I may have to just get one to experience it. I think you know? that that's how I, before yeah. I got my Pixel Fold, I was like, I can sort of see it. Once I got it, I was like, oh, I get it. I don't know if it's worth the money for the mm-hmm. Pixel Fold because it was really expensive, yeah. but I get the use of the form factor. Yeah, it's, it's nice little, to have it, the flexibility. It's a little like VR. If you're going to shop for VR, you can't do it based on screenshots and reviews alone. You really need to put one on your head and go, oh, okay, I get it. It's a yeah. very different technology, obviously. And I, I think, so- Sarah, you would feel the same way where you're like, yeah, the watch is fine, once you had it, you'd realize, oh, but there are times when having it on the cover screen is pretty nice because I don't totally. have to, you know, it's bigger than my watch or whatever, right? Well, and even my phone itself, so my iPhone, which is not near me right the second, but um, I don't even unlock it half the day. I look at my notifications. I see if something's going on. Oh, I got a, something to do with PayPal. Okay, let me go to the computer. Like, it really is, that is my second screen, without me using the full phone. To have that be in a smaller form factor would be awesome. Yeah. I, I want that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and I the mean, prices I'd, are coming yeah. down. $999 for the Razer Plus, or you can just get the Razer for $699. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's not as well reviewed yet, but people are pretty positive about it as well. Yeah, it's also just good to see these taken off and being accepted because I think innovations are still possible and how they look when they're unfolded has only gotten better over time. And I think that if you're somebody who's, let's say, I don't know, you're a hardcore, uh, we'll say iPhone, iPhone hardcoreist. You just can't have anything but an iPhone. You're so into that. Well, if this stuff continues to grow and do well, I feel like Apple has to do some at some oh, point. Oh, yes. Well, Gurman you know? says, what, 26? I think Quo says something around there. Yeah, so, I yeah, mean, it's, yeah, it's mean, probably going to be a tablet to begin with. But, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It, it's sort of like I liken this to cars where it was like at, at some point in the last, I don't know, 20 years, we all just got aerodynamic and cars all started to look alike. And now it's like, let's reinvent this a little bit Mm -hmm. because that's fun let's be creative and i feel i feel like you know the the uh the smartphone category is kind of in that wave now wild west dan when i said not well reviewed but people like it i meant it hasn't been reviewed a lot not that it was not liked yeah they're not ripping on it yeah yeah well, speaking of reviews, uh, if you haven't joined Eileen Rivera and me on Apple Vision Show yet, we review all sorts of things that are all things Apple, and it's a really fun podcast. We would love to have you along for the ride. Every week, we compare what we think Apple's vision is to what we, the actual people, want. We've got producer Amos with us, too. It's a really good time. It's a lot of fun. We'd love to have you with us. Get subscribed now at applevisionshow.com. Etsy is known as being a crafty place to buy crafty things. Uh, Sometimes they're made by a human. Other times they're collected by a human and selected with care. But they're human touched no matter what they are. Uh, It's not supposed to be a place for drop shippers and mass production. That's what Alibaba and AliExpress and even Timu are for. Uh, But Etsy wants to compete with Timu and it wants to keep that human touch. So it's been fighting off the drop shippers that try to sneak around and skirt the rules. Uh, And as a result, 
it has decided to expand its product categories. Uh, in the past, Etsy described the available items as either handmade or vintage. Handmade meant somebody made it. Vintage meant somebody collected it, right? So if you're buying photo cards or old t-shirts from the 80s or something like that. Uh, the new categories are now made by, that's pots, vases, things you make yourself, macrame, etc. Designed by which is stickers, digital illustrations, custom t-shirts that you've screen printed yourself maybe, and things like that. Handpicked by, which is your collectibles, your vintage items, your photo cards. Sourced by is basically supplies. So uh, somebody's providing you beads or clay or sleeves for your cards, etc. Now, Scott, I know you're somebody who makes and sells your art online. Uh, mm. What do you think of Etsy's way of trying to reassure customers that their purchases are coming from real humans? I think that this is probably smart in the long run because essentially this, the stores had started to get a little unwieldy. It was hard to tell uh, whether Etsy cared at the time, but it did seem like I was seeing a lot of stuff that you would buy in bulk or, you know, these are all being sourced in China in some factory. And it was more like, like you say, going to Timu or Alibaba or AliExpress or something like that, even Amazon and buying things there. And I think that they want to, it's not that they don't want growth in new areas. It's just that they're never going to fully go those directions and dominate or, or at least profitably dominate. I think what they want to do is say, well, why don't we pull back and, be, and and remind everybody who we are at our core and who we've always wanted to be, and now we're just going to say, here's what we really truly are, and we're going to be a little more strict about the rules and the kinds of things you can put on there and some other stuff they mention that we won't get into. But yeah, they, yeah. They, and, they, and to be to, to to be clear, these new categories are not a change of the types of things that no. were available. They, these are the same things that were always available. They're just categorizing them four ways instead of two ways. Yeah, it's like brand. It's framing and branding. They're basically saying this this made by design by handpicked by that kind of stuff is a great way to bring it back and say this is what Etsy is. And we got people on here making pottery. We have people taking yarn and yeah. doing stuff L you wouldn't lovingly believe. Lovingly making your couch yeah. cushions yeah. type thing. Here's my question. Um, for anyone who is... I don't know, on Etsy and doing well, uh, you know, doing a drop ship mass production type thing. No, no, What's... no, no. That they do they should they're going to get kicked off if they do drop shit or mass production, right? Well, yeah. so like, so that's my that's question. That's against the is, rules, yeah. That's my question is by adding these new labels to the kind of stuff that you're selling to be authentic, what's to stop anyone from saying, oh, no, I made it myself. Yeah, this mm. isn't enforcement. This is uh, clarification, right? So if somebody was selling beads, that was allowed. Uh, but a lot of people were complaining and saying, well, that's not vintage or handmade. Uh, why is that allowed? So this kind of clarifies the rules for everybody to say like, no, no, it's okay for people to do that. It's not okay for you to mass produce a thousand t-shirts that say, uh, Scott Johnson is great, and then drop ship them on Etsy. Yeah, I mean, there's reasons I would like that, but not, not these. Uh, yeah, here, right. here's the that here's should the go on thing. AliExpress. Not I, on, ex not on I agree, but here's the other thing to to keep in mind: it, it doesn't, like you say, it's not an enforcement policy as much as it is a clarification of what Etsy is. And I think this is good for people who go to Etsy and want to look for stuff. Um, I think that they'll know what stores they're going to like more because they'll adhere to these. And you'll know when you see made by and you see the things they have, there's a legitimacy to that. That's you going, oh, okay, well, they do make pots and I can see him making them. Here's some photos of the guy making the pots he makes. Like whatever. Like you can – you create more authentic and uh, – authentic trustworthiness if that's even a term. Uh, I think that if you go to a thing and it says made by and then you see a bunch of stuff that you could buy in bulk on AliExpress, you're going to go to somebody else's Etsy store. And I think that's a way of self or, having, or having report it. the account, I guess. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think that's a lot kind of what Etsy is going for in, here. Is internet like, let's, argues let's, a lot, and yeah. and they argue based on things that are said because words matter. Uh, and so if Scott is selling his vinyl stickers of his own art, but they're not handmade, he didn't make the stickers. 
that doesn't fall in the handmade care, care category. Should that be allowed? And Etsy's like, great, we have designed by now. That was mm-hmm. designed by Scott. He gets to sell the stickers. He doesn't have to hand lick the glue onto them for them to count on Etsy. You can still sell them. Right. And there are some people, I even bought some from some sellers on Etsy that make stickers for you. So I give them the designed by uh-huh. art. They yeah. do the made by art. And, and then they're, they're together, doing the handmade. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's a very symbiotic relationship on there. So I, I just think this is a great way for them to simplify things a bit and just say, look, this is who we are. It's kind of who we've always been. Let's let's make this just a little bit more like that. And, and we'll go back to the way things were. And I think that's smart because it's their bread and butter. This is where they thrive. And they don't I don't think they want to compete with everything else. They don't want to be Timu. Oh, this is absolutely that. I mean, Etsy does not want, it can't, it can't compete with, you know, some of the fast fashion, you know. I mean, they could, right? Theoretically, they they could just change and become, they could abandon their principles and and just become (laughs) Timu, but, but that's not what they're doing. And I think that's smart because, you know, that's, that's a hard business to compete in. So they're differentiating themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I don't shop on Etsy that often, but, you know, once every couple of years, you know, I'll, I'll get some, you know real nice, um, that I, that I do feel is unique and, um, you know, handcrafted and, you know, all that stuff. That's, that's why I, I like to support people, but I didn't realize that there was so much kind of just mass production going on in Etsy. It doesn't surprise me, but I think it's smart. I think it's smart for the company to be like, this is not the place for that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we'll, we'll weed them out as, as needed, but you know we're a place for something different. It's also because a little bit gonna, of yeah. Unless they embraced it and changed and just you know drove after those dollars, uh, it's going to undermine trust. And that, I think that's what they're trying to do here: is say like we want to keep the trust of the people who use our platform for the reason that we're here. Yeah, and it's also good PR because they got in trouble for raising prices recently, or yeah, people were frustrated. Yeah. So it never hurts to have a happy story out there. Yeah, uh, you know, it turns out inflation comes for all of us. Uh, <laughs> that's why the new entry-level Patreon for Daily Tech News Show is now one thousand uh, dollars. So please sign up now. No, I'm just kidding. yeah, it's not our fault. It's <laughs> yeah, it's just inflation. Uh, all right, uh, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Andrew, who wrote in. Thank you for talking about that study related to coding and Chat GPT. Tom and uh, Chris Ashley talked about this yesterday. Uh, Andrew says, and confirmed something I have encountered occasionally, but never could figure out the why behind what I need to do when I need to do routine coding tasks that I'm not up to the syntax for. I can usually describe them to chat GPT and get something that works quickly. But when I'm building a system with languages that are updating and changing frequently, I'll often get code that works but seems to be missing something. I'll go investigate the docs to find a better way of doing that thing that was added a few months back or even a year ago, and ChatGPT doesn't know about it. This seems to line up with the idea that there are a lot of examples with the old way and only a few with the new. So the old way wins, even if the new way is objectively better. Yeah, this, Chris and I talked about this on Good Day Internet. So if you're not a patron, you wouldn't have got the, the full conversation. But there was a study that said uh, ChatGPT great at helping coders if the problem existed before 2021. Uh, Mm -hmm. But as soon as you're dealing with problems that are newer than that, its efficacy goes way down. And Andrew's like, ah, that's why. (laughs) It makes sense. Like that stuff moves fast, man. Three years out on a problem that happened, we're all, we're way past it usually in that world. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew, for writing in. And thanks to everybody who also writes in. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send thoughts, feelings, Poems, all of thousand dollars, a thousand dollars. Also, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got it in your back pocket, right? If you do, if you can fit a foldable in there, you could fit a thousand yeah, dollars. Send uh, us some folding. <laughs> Scott Johnson, you fit on our show quite well. <laughs> Let folks know where to keep up with you when you're not with us. Well, um, real quick, speaking of stores, uh, I run my own. It's not Etsy, but I also have a lot of designed buy stuff going on over there by me. And uh, I'm currently in a big major sale mode where we're selling a ton of stuff that has been either around forever or it's just time to, to clear out and bring in new stuff. So that means it's all going for very cheap. And there's also a very cool bundle with no shipping that people ought to check out as well. 
Uh, so you can find that at frogpants.com slash store. But also, if you like movies, check out the Film Sack podcast this weekend. Filmsack.com is the place to go. We're going to watch a very old movie called Scarface that holds up, I think, anyway. Mm. And a couple of us haven't seen it. So if you want to hear four uh, friends who have been doing this for, gosh dang it, almost 14 years or something, uh, talk about your favorite movie, then uh, check it out. That's filmsack.com. I'm walking here. It's from that movie, right? Yeah, I'm I walking think, yeah. here. Yeah, I'm walking here. Yeah. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Who's responsible for your data after you're gone? It's, you know, a subject a lot of us don't want to think about much, but we probably should, and it's not easy, and it's a chance for me to get up on a soapbox. So stick around. You don't want to miss it. You can catch GTNS live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow, covering Samsung's Galaxy Unpacked with Gwen Pei Dao and Rob Dunwood joining us. It's going to be fun. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>